live from Singapore. Welcome to our new show, Diving Deeper into the Stories That Matter with crucial context and sharp analysis. This is Insight with me, Haslinda Amin. Asian equities outside Japan get the tailwind from a Wall Street rally supercharged by Tesla that added $150 billion to its market cap and making Elon Musk richer by $26 billion. But can Tesla ever win over value investors? We ask Guy Spires where he is finding value in the overheated markets and why he's still not bullish on China despite the low valuations. As Indian regulators cut down on risky equity derivatives, we speak exclusively to the CEO of National Stock Exchange of India, which operates one of the world's biggest options trading venues. And Japanese markets on edge. As the country gears up for a general election this weekend, the ruling coalition is in danger of losing its majority for the first time since 2009. Well, trepidation in markets, Asian traders looking for direction, unsure what the two elections, the upcoming elections might bring. Remember, we're looking for the Japanese elections over the weekend and the U.S. elections, the election to watch out for just less than two weeks away. MSCI asia Pac index flat at this point in time. Gains for the Hang Seng index, the TIEX, as well as the Kospi. Of course, we're keeping a close eye on developments uh, in Japan, the yen in particular, what that election might mean for Japanese assets. Of course, we've seen the yen trading at about 152 and change. Might it get weaker from here? In terms of U.S. futures, or rather before that, let's take a look at uh, Asian FX. We've been talking about the yen. Let's take a look where that currency is trading at this point in time. We have the dollar pretty uh, steady. Currently, we have Japanese yen at 151.85 flat versus the USD. The Korean won uh, currently at one. Uh, 383 and as far as the Aussie dollar it is uh, currently at 63 66 36 uh, currently the Aussie just a tad weaker versus the USD down about a tenth of 1%. Now some Top global officials at the IMF annual meeting are unimpressed with China's recent economic stimulus, calling for more measures to rebalance growth and greater clarity on policy plans. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says Beijing hasn't tackled overcapacity and weak domestic demand. Brazilian Finance Minister Fernando Haddad says there's insecurity over stimulus. And IMF Director Kristalina Georgieva says China's growth may drop well below 4% in the future. The U.S. was also a focus of the IMF first deputy managing director, Gita Gopinath. She says the world's largest economy remains strong. Speaking with Bloomberg, she also says the result of the U.S. election will have a global impact. It is very important. What happens in the U.S. matters for the U.S. and matters for the whole world. So as you can imagine, it is an important part of the conversation. Is it making people feel paralyzed? And I'm talking about policymakers and I'm talking about, you know, investors. Is it making people feel like they can't really make any moves until there are some outcomes for some of the big events and the elections that are coming down the pike? When you, when you see the data, you don't really get that impression that people are paralyzed. If you look at the U.S. economy and how it's doing, you know, consumption is doing very well. Labor markets are doing well, even if those, they've slowed some. And the financial markets are very strong, financial conditions are easy. So you aren't seeing any you know, negative knocks coming from that uncertainty right now. But yes, I think as we get closer to it, that goes up and we'll see what comes after that. Yeah, and I was speaking with uh, the Buddhist Bank president this morning and he was talking about how it's hard for him to really gauge some of the inflation risks because for them, inflation would be a lot higher. Do you feel like that's the case, that interest rates are going to have to go up more significantly as more tariffs go into place? What we do know is that tariffs are inflationary. They do put pressure on prices. That's usually what we see in the data, looking at past episodes of tariffs that have been put in place, right? Uh, in addition, there is a very important question of what the stance of fiscal policy is going to be around the world and how expansionary it's going to be. Uh, 
the U.S. economy is very strong right now. At the same time, we are seeing inflation coming down, and our expectation is that it will continue to do so, and the Fed will continue to cut rates. Now, if there is a much more expansionary fiscal stance, you know, that could uh, move the argument in a different direction. Are you surprised that interest rates, have, I don't want to say interest rates, that 10-year Treasury yields, that the benchmark Treasury yields on the longer term, or even just uh, globally, aren't reflecting more the $100 trillion of global debt that you've reflected in your latest IMF projection? The rate is going for the U.S. debt is going to also be a function of the strength of the U.S. economy, the strength of its institutions, and there's tremendous faith in that. Again, the U.S. economy is one of the strongest among the major economies, if you look at those. And when we, when we compare the U.S. to the other G20 economies, it's the only economy that's, whose GDP is higher now than we had projected before the pandemic. The only major economy. So it's a very strong economy, a lot of confidence in it, and that's showing up in the yield uh, numbers too. And that was IMF First Deputy Managing Director Gita Gopinath speaking with Bloomberg's Lisa Abramovich. Well, we'll ask Guy Spires where he's finding value in the overheated markets and why he's still not bullish on China despite the low valuations. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Tesla's blowout earnings sent the stock surging 22% in U.S. trading overnight, boosting a gauge of the magnificent 7 to a 3-month high. And with Tesla's mixed earnings record earlier this year being one of the main drags on the index, this opens up the group for more potential gains ahead with Google owner Alphabet. Microsoft, Meta, Apple, and Amazon all set to report earnings next week. Confidence in U.S. stocks and the MAX 7 has been one of the key insights we've been hearing this week from some of our top guests. Does there come a point in time when the system breaks and the Fed can't fix it? Theoretically, yes. In, in our lifetimes, I don't know. Uh, so I think for now, it probably just pays not to think too much, just close your eyes and buy, um, you know, probably mag seven. I think it's a key part of a portfolio, um, but what we're seeing, and I think it's slightly more exciting, is a broadening. Uh, of the performance of the S&P rather than just a, a narrow concentration. It's been a, actually a pretty broad bull market. Uh, when you look at it from where it started to where we are now, there's a lot of just about everything's up at least 20%. But I think we're looking at 6,300 next year. And by the end of the decade, I think a, a conservative target is actually 8,000. So I, I think we've got a, a decade where we have a bull market. Well, let's get more insights on the equity market and the MAG7 and where they go from here with renowned value investor and Warren Buffett uh, disciple, Guy Spire, who's founder and CEO at Aquamarine. Guy, good to have you with us. Uh, you know, we had it loud and clear from my guest this year, or this week rather, that uh, the MAG7 is the way to go. It's going strong. It's made a very strong comeback. You've got to stay invested in the MAG7. Uh, unless you were never invested in the first place, and, to, and then you just watch from the <laughs> sidelines and say, "Wow," and that's that's my story. And uh, you know, I've I've underperformed the S and P because of that for the last uh, uh, four or five years, and it's painful. But you know, this is a very very long term term game. So the the Nifty Fifty in the seventies, you know, they they fell apart, and it looks like the Magnificent Seven aren't going to fall apart anytime soon. And, and by the way, about two years ago, in frustration, I ended up buying some Google. So I'm a little bit participated in the Magnificent Seven. But it, the world is big and the game is long. So don't worry about me. Uh, Guy, if there's further upside, much further upside, why not get in now? Or are you concerned about the perhaps over-exuberance when it comes to the Max 7? I think that, uh, you know, I have a theory and it's interesting because I'm an atheist that God is watching me. So if I were to get in, then that would be the, la the worst time because God would test me and the whole market and send all of them crashing down at exactly that moment. But the reality is that behaviorally, behaviorally over a lifetime of doing this, 
if I just train myself not to buy when the market is exuberant in the expectation of even more exuberance, uh, I've learned and observation shows that you do better over time. I mean, Warren Buffett uh, never owned the Nifty 50, the popular stocks, and he did well over the 40 or 50 years. I've not done as well as Warren Buffett, but over the last 25 years, I have done absolutely fine. So it, you, th there's a focus on those Magnificent Seven, but there's lots of other things to be had in other places. And survival is more important than performance. So my focus is surviving to the next 25 years rather than just playing the latest trend, if you like, or the most interesting thing on the market. Even if you're just an observer of the MAX7 and the rally they've had so far, Guy, I'm just wondering what risks you see out there. We have the U.S. election coming up. We have a Fed that is likely to cut rates less than anticipated. Are these likely to impact the performance of the MAX7 going forward? Amazingly enough, you know, those Magnificent Seven are something that we've never seen before. I mean, they are, in a way, more powerful than even the large superpowers. And they move in the world as if they're not, if, as if, as if they don't really care. And they can move, they can duck and dive around attempts by superpowers to control them. So despite global uncertainty, and the global uncertainty is through the roof. I mean, we are, as Niall, Neil Ferguson says, we're in Cold War II. And there's huge superpower rivalry in many different areas, conflicts breaking out. But those Magnificent Seven, uh, it seems to me, will kind of ride above that in a way. The, the world, the global world order could fall apart pretty badly, but those companies will continue to, work, to do well. Mm. How's that shaping your investment strategy, especially on the back of this upcoming election, which is meant to be the closest and the most divisive election in U.S. history? Is that shaping the way you look at how you're invested? Yeah, so, so and the election, I think many people are saying it, it'll be the most consequential election of, uh, you know, perhaps in the lifetime of the United States. I have trained myself, and it's worked really well for me. I'm super interested in the politics, but I invest as if the politics is not there, and that's that served me particularly well. I think that what, what we have to do as investors is uh, you have to assume that one or the other of the parties gets in and only invest in places where you know you'll do fine either way. Interestingly enough, the Magnificent Seven uh, is certainly a group that is like that. But there are many other groups of companies that are like that that will do well either way. And so that's what I have to do, rather than what some people do is to sort of like conflate the politics with, with their investment strategy. Mm. We keep hearing from some of our guests this week that you have to play the U.S. market. That's where you're going to get the best returns. From your own perspective, uh, where would you put your money? U.S., DM, EM, where do you see the best opportunities out there? I mean, uh, interesting enough, I, I don't think I'm a bear on China. I think that China is probably oversold and that there is value there. And many investors in New York and uh, in the United States kind of like hate China right now for all sorts of reasons, and that probably bodes well. So it's an interesting place to look. But I think that for me and for the overwhelming majority of the world's capital today, home base is the United States. And that's not just a bias. It's because the United States has just an incredible strategic advantage as an area to do business from the two oceans on either side, from the incredible um, uh, agrarian economy in the middle of the country, from the canals, from the Mississippi River. There's no other geography that is as good as the United States. So for me, living in Switzerland, the United States is an extraordinary place to invest and to kind of keep the bulk of my capital. It's an interesting thing that I, it's, uh, the question was asked of me and I couldn't answer it properly, but I'm not sure that if, so Warren Buffett did as well as he did over the last 40, 50 years, in part because he lived right in the middle of that incredible economy. And other countries are not as well placed strategically. For example, China has uh, shortages of all sorts of commodities, like water is not very good in China. Agriculture is not that great in China, if I'm not mistaken. And so for me, and for many investors, it makes rational sense for the United States to be the home base. 
So stay invested in the U.S., but we also talked about how there are opportunities in China, given where valuations are right now. Yet you say you're not buying or selling China. Why? What is the overriding, I guess, thinking behind that perspective? Yeah. I mean, and, and sometimes, and you need, we need to be clear, I mean, if you think that I'm all-knowing or all-wise, I'm certainly not. In my case, I've had one company that's done extraordinarily well in China. It's now a significant portion of my portfolio. I'm very happy with it. The company is BYD. And so, you know, I, I, don't, I, I already have a very large exposure to China just through appreciation, if you like. So that, it's, that's the simple reason. I think that if I was 50% cash, I would look very, very carefully at, at, at having exposure to China. Absolutely. And I, I think Let's that, I mean, I'll tell you this. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, uh, no, no, you go ahead. You ask the question. Uh, you talked about BYD. Of course, it's done really well, up more than 60% since the low we saw uh, back in January or February. So you've done pretty well in keeping that stock. But people say that for BYD to continue to do well, to, to get further upside, you have to take a look at the sales outside of China. How are you assessing that? Yeah, and, and so I'll give you one amazing example. So obviously, BYD is a huge threat to domestic automobile manufacturers in Europe and the United States. And so uh, investors in Europe and the United States focus on these tariffs that are going to be slapped on BYD. But the rest of the world has been growing. I mean, Europe and the United States is becoming a smaller and smaller proportion of the global economy. And BYD has been actively uh, seeking out sales in all sorts of other regions in the world. And so Europe and the United States matter less and less to a global company like BYD. And I think that, so, you know, both with the Magnificent, Magnificent Seven and BYD and companies like Alibaba, what really is fascinating to me is that as the, as the politics of the last 50 years feels very shaky and crumbles, what some people think is that the, the whole world is going to go, or the economy is going to go to hell in a handbasket. There is superpower rivalry. There are wars breaking out. But there are companies that, in the midst of that, go from strength to strength. In a way, they are the glue of the global economy. And so we should not, as an investors, despite our concern over a geopolitical rivalry, uh, withdraw from our... And actually, we're not. I mean, we see the right. markets hitting new highs. But you have to consider the risk, right? You take a look at Alibaba, for instance. The risk came not just from the U.S., but also uh, from the Chinese government itself. You hold Alibaba stocks. I mean, uh, how long do you think you'll hang on to it? I mean, what's the potential in terms of up upside for that stock? I mean, I think there's enormous upside. I, I've, I've said in the past what it, Alibaba, you can describe Alibaba the way people used to describe General Motors in the United States. What is good for Alibaba is good for China. What is good for China is good for Alibaba. And you can say the same uh, for Alibaba and China and the world. And I think that we all go through periods of hubris. I, I get a sense that uh, China has kind of gone through a period of hubris, but I don't believe that they have lost their sense of rationality. They understand that the future is delivered to them and their population if everybody gets richer. And as they've taken actions that potentially have put the brake on that, they've realized that it's put the brake and they need to slow down on those kinds of things. And we saw it in various ways. They've they've lightened up on some of the high restrictions that they put on Tencent, for example. So uh, uh, the, the world goes through these cycles and we need, we need to not pay too much attention to the wiggle. I will tell you that what most... Uh, would be concerning to me and is something that I cannot entirely rule out is I say to myself, provided the leadership in China is acting rationally and acts in the rational interest of China and the population of China, we're going to do great. But every now and then it seems that like the governments of some countries do some things which are utterly irrational. And so I can't mm. entirely rule that out. And that's my biggest risk, if you like. Guy, we know that you're coming to us from Mumbai. It is a place that you love. India is a market that you love, despite the fact that we're seeing overstretched valuations there. Uh, what is it about India that you're so convinced, you know, will give you the returns that you're looking for? <clears throat> I mean, um, you know, uh, India is a, is a population on a scale that is only matched by China. And that in itself is something extraordinary. At the same time, unlike China, which you could imagine has a kind of a closed architecture, it's its own thing. It's its walled garden. 
India is utterly not that way. A friend that I was with yesterday was noting how many CEOs of global corporations are Indians. Indians travel in the world extraordinarily well. So as I was telling you earlier, it's of great interest to even uh, Jensen Huang, who was here, here, here yesterday, uh, the data that India is generating off a 1.4 billion population is something that he's clearly extremely interested in for his a AI systems. And so uh, uh, India has just got this enormous potential that it is only just getting going. And as we know, it's the world's youngest population, uh, the, the, the largest country that has a population under 35. We suddenly woke up over the last year and a half to discover that China's got an aging population and they actually are not going to successfully replace uh, the population that's there, right. whereas India is just getting started. Guy, yeah, you, you love you India, just... yet, yet, yet you, just... you own only yeah, two stocks. Why is that? You <laughs> own what? You own care ratings, you own IEX India. Why own only two stocks when this market holds so much potential, as you say? And, you know, I was I was with uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank yesterday. At the time that I first visited India, they had about a U.S. dollar, two billion market cap. And today uh, they have a U.S. dollar, about 40 billion dollar market cap, which is just extraordinary. Um, uh, you know, I go very carefully and very slowly and try and under try and get into situations where I think I have an edge and where I think that the uh, bets are stacked in my favor. And so, for example, if you take NVIDIA or if you take uh, Kotak Bank, I think that these are these are perhaps at the times I looked at them too highly valued and I didn't feel like I was buying off a distressed buyer. And uh, what you want to do is go to places where people are kind of uncertain and unhappy. So, uh, but I probably should own more in India. And let's just remember, it's not about how many stocks I own in India. It's just about owning India. And it may be that, uh, you know, one or two of What's fascinating about Kotak Mahindra Bank is that they're a kind of a Goldman Sachs, a deeply, deeply respected and amazing culture. So it may be that you just have to own one of those for the next 20 years. I have a friend in Singapore whose only stock in India was HDFC Bank, and he's done absolutely extraordinarily mm. well. A similar story. Uh, Guy, we know that you and a group of friends paid to have a charity uh, dinner, lunch with Warren Buffett. What was the best advice he gave you and that's contributed to how you're doing right now in your own investments? I think uh, we can tie that in to um, what my friend said about these Indian CEOs like Satyam and Nadella. I think that what it was not what he said. He said many things, but it really helped me to see that this man is not trying to become the richest man in the world. He's actually trying to live his best life. It so happened that in his case, his best life is lived by spending all day analyzing companies, not dissimilar to, to, to my friend Garish, who just wants to spend all day visiting companies. And we've spent an intensive three or four days visiting companies. Whereas, for example, I figured out that I liked skiing and I like reading about history, and I like uh, having friends in mathematics. So it helped me to turn around and focus on living my best life. And it, 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 is, it does concern me that there are many right. people who... Go ahead. Go ahead, they're, finish they're your sentence, like, Guy. Yeah, sorry, a bit like Lord of the Rings. They're kind of going after the, the kind of super power and influence. And actually, at the end of the day, uh, our time on this planet is limited. Guy, and many people fantastic spend to have you with us. Guy Spire, CEO and founder at Aquamarine. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Thank you so much. Welcome back. You're watching Insight. Surging inflows from local funds are coming to the rescue of Indian stocks as they witness the biggest foreign sell-off since early 2020. Mutual funds, banks and insurance firms have plowed more than $10 billion into the country's stock market this month, taking inflows for the year to over $50 billion. That's as overseas funds withdraw over $8 billion on a net basis amid price evaluation, slowing profit growth and renewed interest in 
Chinese stocks. Let's get more on India's markets with our next guest, who runs the country's largest stock exchange in terms of total and average daily turnover for equities. National Stock Exchange of India MD and CEO Ashish Kumar Chauhan joins us exclusively from Mumbai. Thanks for joining us. It's been such a great run for the last five years. We talked about that five uh, trillion dollar market cap from one uh, previously. How does it look like for the next five years? How much uh, optimism do you have? Well, I'm uh, hugely optimistic. It's, I think, just the beginning. Uh, probably India's uh, time today is uh, where uh, China was probably 2005, 2006, in that range. So it got a, a real boost post that, and probably India is in that stage to take off. So what does that mean in terms of future market cap in five years from now, perhaps 10, 15? <laughs> I mean, I'm being a, a stock market uh, sort of regulator. Uh, and stock exchanges in India are frontline regulators. So usually uh, I don't have views on wh where the markets will be after even one day or one second. But broadly, our job is to provide a well-functioning, well-regulated, uh, fair, transparent, efficient, low-cost, and orderly markets. And that's what uh, we will continue to provide. And of course, um, if India is doing what it does uh, and better uh, going forward, then probably you will see uh, increase, uh, which is manifold. We have seen uh, in Mr. Modi's time on last 10 years, that's 2014 he took over. Uh, it's exactly 10 years, and now market capitalization has gone up uh, 650%. Um, and that's a very, very large number in 10 years. And it's, for me, it's just the beginning. So the pace of growth, the current pace of growth you're seeing right now is sustainable and you can probably exceed in a way. Absolutely. It's, it's reasonable in a way. 7% uh, is something which India has grown over the last uh, 25, 30 years, give and take uh, half a percentage point both sides. And so this is something which is stable, but if the technology continues to evolve faster, India is the center of technology evolution in the world now because of the way the Indian public has uh, taken to the technology like fish to the water. And that's mm -hmm. where most of the growth, most of the new things uh, and most of the companies that are coming are basically using uh, newer and newer technology to create wealth. And uh, the newer technology don't require uh, that much of capital to uh, create more capital. So I call it uh, India's framework uh, is slightly different from say, China's or even Europe's in the 18th and 19th and 20th century, which is what I call capitalism with a lot of capital. India's capitalism is capitalism with very little capital, but it creates great wealth uh, going forward if one, two, five, ten, hundred of them succeed. And now we have created a, a wave of entrepreneurs. They keep on coming and coming and coming because each right. entrepreneur has very little investment uh, and that's what is actually fueling India's growth in newer and newer areas. Uh, you're talking about momentum in the Indian market. We're certainly seeing that in terms of uh, momentum in the IPO market, especially on the back of that uh, Hyundai uh, India IPO. I'm just wondering what your views are on whether, you know, that momentum in IPOs can be sustained into 2025, 2026. If the markets continue, in fact, today uh, there is a story, I think, in... Uh, uh, financial times that the rest of the world, uh, despite the market seeding all time high, uh, there is uh, very little IPO activity. While as India has witnessed a huge amount of IPO activity, in fact, uh, I was talking to one of the people I saw today morning on Bloomberg uh, yesterday about uh, uh, Hyundai raising three billion. They could not even believe that uh, Indian markets have come that far that a single uh, IPO could raise three billion dollars. And uh, again, Monday there is one large. Uh, IPO, uh, which is um, sort of uh, listing. So in this first seven months, uh, 46 large IPOs have listed, although our concept of large is slightly smaller than what you would do in uh, US or Europe. But still, the number of IPOs are like humongous. And if the markets continue, I believe India is the only place where currently a large number of IPOs are happening uh, across the world. This is the perfect segue to ask you this question, Ashish. How about your own IPO, NSC IPO? There's been a lot of expectations. It's coming. Is it coming? When is it coming? We, we don't have any visibility because uh, we have uh, applied for no objection certificate. There is a process. Uh, once the process gets over in terms of giving us the approvals of uh, creating um, and getting that no objection certificate, uh, after that only we will be able to 
prepare our uh, RHP, and so it will take uh, some time uh, as of now. What are the considerations? And when you say it'll take some time, are we looking at the next six to twelve months? Uh, I have no visibility on that because it's up to the regulator, uh, and so uh, it remains to be seen how uh, this plays out. When it comes to IPOs, there are concerns. Uh, when it comes to SEBI, SEBI says it is concerned about the quality of uh, IPOs, especially among the SMEs. Uh, do you share that concern? In a way, uh, yes. Uh, SMEs are, uh, in a way, very tiny companies, not even micro companies, uh, which uh, raise up to a million, a million and a half uh, dollars. Uh, India is the only country in the world which is able to raise even $100,000 for a small company. And there has been a a kind of euphoric rise in many of their uh, uh, subscriptions, even tens of thousands of times uh, the issues get uh, oversubscribed. And that's where uh, the regulators has, um, regulator has shown concern, even exchanges have shown concern. And we have taken uh, steps where uh, the, the fly-by-night uh, small operators don't end up coming into the markets. And so it's an evolving process. It had happened to India once in 1994, after which... Uh, uh, the stock exchange had stopped uh, listing of small stocks. But again, uh, the exchanges were told to do it in uh, take their uh, prospectors in 2012. In last 12 years, uh, almost 1,000 companies have listed on Indian stock exchange, which are very tiny. Many of them have gone to main board. Mm. But the um, idea is to ensure that we provide the safe marketplace for investors to uh, kind of invest right. in even the smallest of stocks. What other steps can... NSC implement to allay the concerns of SEBI? No, we have, uh, of course, been working with the uh, regulator SEBI, and uh, we have uh, ensured that the com companies without uh, profits do not come to the market, but not only companies uh, with, with profits come to the market, but they have free cash flows coming into the market because of the accounting, the way it works. Many times companies show profit, but they don't have uh, free cash flow uh, uh, coming out, so we have now made a regulation to make it free cash flow. We have also suggested to the regulator to increase the lot size of the SME companies uh, to uh, almost uh, $6,000 uh, per lot, which is not, um, which is very small for the main board, which is only one share, while as here we want to do it $6,000 per uh, lot so that small investors don't come in and whoever comes in comes with uh, a lot of uh, studies and uh, understanding and analysis. And so, we are slowly working with the regulators to ensure that only the knowledgeable people come to the SME market, which is supposed to be highly risky. Uh, SEBI is also concerned about speculative retail trading and its implemented measures uh, to perhaps curb that kind of activity. Might that have an impact on volumes for you? Certainly. It, it should have an impact. And that's the purpose of SEBI's regulation, that uh, they have seen a uh, meteoric rise in uh, the derivatives volumes, especially uh, options trading. There has not been much rise in the futures trading, but the options trading has uh, increased manifold over the last uh, several years. And uh, there is a perception that a uh, large number of small players are coming, although the, the total percentage they trade as a percentage of the markets is less than 2%, uh, but still... Uh, numerous people are coming into that market, getting attracted to uh, higher volatility. Uh, and that's where the mm. regulators have uh, shown that they need to work and ensure that the small investors go towards mutual funds or invest for the long term. <clears throat> and that's where uh, uh, they have increased the lot size from November 20, uh, instead of uh, around uh, between uh, $6,000 to $12,000 or $13,000 uh, lot size. It right. has actually doubled. And so it's going to ensure that uh, many uh, people will uh, not go through the options market and might prefer to uh, directly invest into the stocks going forward. Uh, Ashish, some people are suggesting that your revenues will also be impacted to the extent of about 20%. Is that, uh, I, I guess, a fair assessment, uh, a, a fair gauge? It, the way the Indian exchanges work, especially MSE, is that our main job is to act as regulators, as uh, uh, frontline regulators. And if the revenues come and profits come, it's a byproduct of uh, regulation, regulations job uh, well done. And so we don't uh, worry too much on whether our revenues go up or down. But uh, what is required is to provide uh, the markets which people trust 
uh, and people think that uh, this market is for the people, by the people, of the people. And that's where uh, we work with the regulators in every uh, area where uh, they want to protect small investors in any way they can. But there is such a thing as over-regulation that might just stifle uh, liquidity, creativity. Your thoughts on that? In a way, uh, any developing economy like India, I mean, India is an outlier in terms of the, the per capita income, vis uh, the size of the market. Today, India is the fourth largest market after uh, US, China, and Japan. Uh, and uh, despite having per capita very low income, and in some ways, the regulators and governments need to create policies uh, which ensure that people uh, invest for long term and create uh, more wealth um, rather than uh, indulging incessantly in uh, uh, trading for the sake of trading. And that's where uh, we continue to support uh, the government and regulatory initiatives in this regard. Mm. We know that you're the world's largest derivatives market. Sebi has come out to say that is not really a crown it really wants to wear. Your response? No, it's a, it's a correct way to look at it. At the same time, uh, even uh, otherwise, because we have per uh, transaction very low uh, value in India, our number of trades and number of orders per day are now almost 50% of all the exchanges in the world put together. So we'll continue to wear that crown of being the largest exchange or largest marketplace of any type in the world in terms of number of orders and number of trades. Value-wise, we don't uh, wear that crown either way. We are not the largest in terms of the value of the options traded. We are only largest in terms of the number of contracts because we our contracts used to be $6,000 and US or Europe uh, have pretty much... Uh, 50 or 100 times more uh, per contract. That's why uh, this crown uh, comes to us. But you have to wear all sorts of crown uh, in your day-to-day uh, -day life, and uh, that's how we take it. We don't uh, take we wear those crown uh, or crowns um, uh, gladly, but we, it's still a part of the job, and we need to ensure that we provide well-functioning market which works for every participant. And uh, we have worked that way till now. Uh, and today, uh, right. I mean, on a good day, we would get uh, 20 billion orders on six hours, uh, 15 minutes. And the entire world doesn't get even half of that or probably similar numbers. And that's where uh, this is the largest market of any type in the world. It will remain uh, for very long now going forward because the way India's number of people participating is increasing every day. In the last six months alone, we have got 10 million new people who have joined directly with us. We are the ID market, unlike most other markets. We know who is trading on us, and that's where the number of people coming into the Indian markets is humongous. Right. And uh, we need to increase our technology and capacities to ensure that we uh, <coughs> satisfy uh, the requirements coming out. Ashish, just one final question before we let you go. We've been talking at length on this show about how uh, money is flowing from India to China. Are you concerned about that flow? No, I think uh, uh, it's a basically some, some, some sort of a Index rebalancing when uh, a country's uh, stock prices go up, uh, some of the uh, emerging market indices which give a weightage uh, based on the market cap, uh, that's where uh, sudden move in China might have uh, kind of created that situation. But today, Chinese market is already uh, actually steady down and coming down. And so uh, these kind of temporary phenomenon are, uh, are not uh, to be taken as kind of a trend, but uh, somewhere on the line, uh, Indian own uh, internal uh, money that is uh, coming as uh, flow. As I told you, we have now more than 100 million people directly investing and uh, also through mutual funds and uh, provident funds and pension fund extra, probably 60 to 100 million odd uh, more people. And that's where a lot of flow uh, is coming into the Indian markets. And I really uh, sort of, I hope uh, and think that slowly when uh, the U.S. Uh, dollar starts stabilizing because suddenly U.S. dollar has picked up uh, pace across the world against all currencies. And so there are many such imbalances right. which are being uh, kind of balanced currently. And uh, over a period, uh, many of the foreigners also will uh, come back to this market being uh, the growth market here. 
Ashish, thank you so much for joining us. Ashish Kumar Chauhan of the National Stock Exchange. Now, still to come, Japan gears up for a general election this weekend with the ruling coalition in danger of losing its majority for the first time since 2009. We'll discuss the implications next. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Voters in Japan head to the ballot box this Sunday. Polls show the ruling coalition led by Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba may fail to win a majority for the first time since 2009. Japan economy and government reporter Alistair Gale joins us now in Tokyo. Alistair, put this in perspective for us. It does seem like we're going to go back to that revolving Prime Minister door. I mean, why are we here? Why is this happening? Right, yes, we may be back to uh, the bad old days of Japanese prime ministers not staying in office for, for too long. Of course, uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was the exception to that. Uh, but Prime Minister Ishiba now is in a difficult situation. The polling is very bad. Uh, it looks like, as you say, they may lose a majority, the ruling LDP. And it's really because of a scandal that's affected the LDP over the last couple of years where lawmakers have been found to be lining their pockets with money which is from their supporters, which is meant to go into sort of party funds, but they've actually been receiving that money themselves. Uh, Ishiba has tried to move to um, end that scandal by uh, punishing some of the lawmakers inside the LDP, but the public anger is still very high here. So there's definitely going to be a protest vote whether or not the LDP can reach that um, majority with its coalition party, Komeito, is very much up in the air. So we may be looking at a very late result here, and Ishiba may be scrambling to try and keep his government uh, together. So what's key here, Alistair? I mean, are we talking about urban, rural, older workers, demographics? How is this going to play out? Right. Well, the LDP has long had the support of elder Jap older Japanese people, particularly those in the countryside. But we've done some reporting this week around Japan. And what we're hearing is that even those people who are the traditional supporters for the party are upset about what this scandal has, how the scandal has played out. They feel that they've been betrayed by the party and they want to register a protest. And the Japanese system, you get two votes. One is for a, a person who would be your representative in your region. You also get a vote in the proportional representation um, side of things for the party. And what we're hearing is a lot of voters feel that this is a moment where they can show their anger at the party and how it's handled this scandal. Because these lawmakers, you know, they, some of them have been told that they can't represent the LDP in this election. But really, the public feels that the way that the prime minister has dealt with this is perhaps too weak. And now he's going to feel the blowback at the ballot box. Alistair, thank you so much for that perspective. Japan economy and government reporter Alistair Gale joining us from Tokyo. Well, for more on the election's potential impact on markets, Bloomberg reporter Avril Hong joins me now. Trepidation, right? We've seen how assets uh, in Japan are pretty much uh, waiting what happens this weekend. Yeah, and I think it's already being clearly reflected in the performance of the topics and how it has underperformed compared to its developed market peers. I mean, it's all this concern about whether there's going to be a slowing in policy implementation if we don't get uh, the ruling coalition with that sizable majority. Um, but we're also keeping an eye on some of these stocks like the defense names. Of course, they've been gaining ground. We can see a reversal potentially of that. I mean, of course, you know that Ishiba was a former uh, defense minister, so that has affected the outlook for those bunch of stocks. But I think uh, one interesting perspective that our MLive colleague, uh, Mark Cranfield, has also just put out on the blog is slower policy implementation could influence the BOJ in a way to you know, keep easy settings for longer. That's going to mean potentially weakness in the Japanese currency, and we know what that means for Japanese stocks. I mean, we, we have... 
particular. Exporters in particular, and look into the corporate earnings season that's up ahead. This could really help, you know, when they come through with their outlooks with the weakness in the yen. But talk about yen volatility. We've seen yen volatility since since July. That hasn't abated, and you can only imagine it will pick up speed. Yeah, I mean, after the BOJ surprise rate hike and the August ructions, was really interesting to see how when Ishiba came to power in his first week in office, he managed to send the Japanese currency weaker. I mean, we saw how he said, you know, Japan's not ready for higher borrowing rates. Some have since kind of said that this uh, was because of his inexperience communicating with markets, but the damage was done. And then you think about how this week we are hearing from Ueda, and he says that they have time to consider their policy steps. So that suggests that we're not going to see a move by the BOJ next week, although October was never really on the table. I think it was more a December, January kind of story. Uh, but we have also a really interesting backdrop. Arguably, to your point about July, the weakness then on the Japanese currency was what prompted the BOJ to hike. So, you know, what gives? What happens if we see the yen at 160? Is that going to heighten uh, the BOJ move uh, expectations and the odds of it in December? Well, I won't see you complaining if the yen goes to 160, <laughs> that's for sure. Not you either. <laughs> so it's also about inflation in Japan. That's always been the key issue for the economy. Yeah. And we had that latest CPI data. What is that pointing to? Yeah, we had the Tokyo numbers earlier today. And of course, this is an indicator for the nationwide trends. They are coming in lower than 2% on the headline print for the first time in five months. But if you look under the hood, core inflation was higher than forecast. So it gives you the sense that, you know, inflation, as we've seen for much of this year in Japan, is coming back. And that for a BOJ to unlock another rate high is just a matter of time. So politics might slow things a little, but, you know, it's just an eventual outcome. What is the positioning out there, especially options positioning? What is it telling us? It's telling us to expect volatility. I mean, if you look at the two-week implied vols, uh, it is not just about the BOJ or the Japan general election this weekend because two-week encompasses the timeline where we're going to see the US election and the Federal Reserve. And that two-week uh, timeline is higher than one week. So that tells you what traders are potentially bracing more for, not just what's happening in Japan, but also in the US. Well, you never thought that the Japan election is going to be one of the risks we're seeing at this point in time. Avril Hong, thank you so much for that. And speaking of uh, elections, that election uh, in the US, that's what uh, investors are focusing on. Let's take a look where US futures are showing us at this point in time. Taking a look where we are, of course, uh, futures pointing to a pretty muted open, currently flat. We're seeing uh, Dow Jones futures also pointing in the same direction. In terms of treasuries, of course, it is about what uh, the Fed will be doing. Will it pull back? on plans to cut rates further. Two-year yields at 4.0616, 10 year yields 4.1879. Well, before we go, here's a look at our guests for next week. We'll speak exclusively with uh, former GE CEO Larry Culp, who now leads the company's aerospace unit. Hear his thoughts on the challenges in the aerospace industry and his growth outlook for Asia. Plus, we'll get insights on the business environment in Singapore with the executive of his hospitality giant Banyan Tree, state-owned investor Tomasek and asset manager Capital. That is it for Insight Horizons Middle East and Africa is next. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg.